The Steve Gill Show. Hey, welcome back in. This is The Steve Gill Show, and joining us a very special guest today. Many times when I would go out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, in the uh, days after 9-11, they would be saying that uh, former Vice President, uh, then Vice President Dick Cheney, was at an undisclosed location. And when I was in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, I'd look over and say, no, there's his plane. He's he's here. I, I knew where you were, Mr. Vice President. It's good to have you with us. Well, it's good to be here today, Steve. I uh... Yeah, it was a little hard to conceal the <laughs> Usually, I can't remember the name of that butcher shop in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. If you weren't there, your Secret Service were guy, guys were over there buying steaks. Right. No, they they uh, they live pretty well out there. <laughs> it is a beautiful place, and I know uh, that you and, and Liz and, and the family have, uh, have enjoyed the time out there. Uh, great book. The book, In My Time, a personal and political memoir that uh, is uh, is now at uh, at bookstores and on uh, Nooks and Kindles everywhere. Very direct, very straightforward. I mean, you, you basically, it's like you've always been. You tell it like it is. Not a lot of flash and flamboyance. It's it's the dragnet, just the facts, ma'am. And that's attracted some criticism from some that, that wanted you to be all apologetic and and whiny and navel gazing and metrosexual, I guess they clearly don't know Dick Cheney. Well, they uh, I think they know now if they've read the book. <laughs> uh, but I know I um, uh, something I thought about uh, over the years, but I'd never written. Well, I collaborated with my wife years ago on a book on the Congress, but uh, it was a uh, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it, um, especially working with my daughter Liz. And uh, she was my co-author, and I think produced pretty good results. How did you keep all this? Because I know one of the dangers for those in public life anymore is if you keep notes, if you keep mm-hmm. diaries. Oh, they're going to they're gonna subpoena those and then use them against you in a court of law. You saw one of your top assistants get prosecuted for, for not remembering things the way others remembered things. How did you keep track of this without taking that risk, or were you just willing to take the risk? Well, I didn't keep a diary. I, I didn't operate that way because of those very concerns, and... Of course, my early days in uh, in Washington were back during Watergate, and I'd watch what happened uh, um, as uh, some people were were correctly or incorrectly uh, got nailed because of all the records they kept, including the president himself. And we didn't do anything in the pro- immoral or inappropriate or illegal, obviously. But uh, the thing that was especially helpful were oral histories. And in recent years, it's gotten to be the practice, and I think it's a good one, where uh, a lot of uh, operations uh, out there now, uh, in fact, uh, write oral histories. For example, there were three of them done on my time in the Pentagon. Uh, the Miller Center down at the University of Virginia, uh, Texas uh, A&M down at the Bush Library down there, and then the uh, Department of Defense itself had a group of uh, historians who kept uh, uh, sat down and interviewed me for several days after I left the Defense Department to establish that written record. So I had about 600 pages of, of recollections uh, just on the Defense Department years alone. As you were talking with uh, with business associates and friends and political colleagues, I mean, were there moments when they're going, hey, do you remember this? And you're going, man, I'd forgotten about that. That ought to be in the book. Yes, there was some of that. And uh, sitting down with various folks, or we'd get off of what I found uh, – helpful was to talk to some of the people that I'd shared that time with. The fact is you can take, you know, three or four people, put them through exactly the same experience, sitting there side by side uh, and uh, seeing exactly the same thing, hearing the same words, but they'll come away and five or 10 or 15 years later, their recollections of that that meeting will differ. Um, I had uh, situations of stories I've told for years that uh, it turned out were inaccurate in one respect or another. And we had to go back and do a lot of fact-checking to make sure that, uh, that everything I said in there was, was as accurate as we could make it. So it uh, requires a lot of work, a lot of good people who are willing to dig into the records, but there are still considerable records kept out there, and that's a big help. Some of your critics are saying that the book is not apologetic enough, that there were only a couple of instances where you said, well, you know, we could have done this better, we should have done this different. Yeah, this isn't a book, you know, as, as I read it, that you're spending a lot of time second-guessing what went on. You're trying to lay out for history what went on. That's correct. And uh, I really, uh, I mean, I'm not inclined to be apologetic anyway, just by nature. But I, uh, I found that it was um, uh, well, a lot of your critics – uh, would take the position that, well, uh, the book doesn't have enough apologies in it, or you didn't apologize for X. And usually what that means is, uh, because there are some places where I say 
I didn't uh, do things right. Um, usually what it means is places where they disagreed with, with the policy and they want you to apologize for the policy. Well, I'm not much inclined to do that, and uh, and I didn't hear. I mean, I can go back and look at things that I disagree with uh, that I learned um, partly as a result of that experience, for example, wage price controls um, or uh, the way I conducted myself in my youth when I got kicked out of Yale twice. Uh, there's, there's plenty of things in there where I did a mea culpa. I just didn't always do it in a way that satisfied our critics, and that's partly uh, – that's their problem. One of your former colleagues, uh, a, a good friend of ours as well, uh, former Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld, talks about the mm-hmm. known, the unknown, you know, what, that you've got to operate in public policy with what you know at the time, and hindsight's always twenty twenty. You don't get into a lot of, well, you know, if we'd known that then what we know now, you've got to operate by what you know at the time. Right. That's exactly right. When you look at some of the critics, uh, you know, I think some people were surprised in the media that, that folks like Condi Rice, folks like General Colin Powell, who you were very close to early in your career, who you helped move along in their careers, have been some of the most virulent critics. What went wrong with those relationships? Well, I, I, you know, it's difficult to, to spell out in, in any detail. fact was, with respect to General Powell, that um, I picked him to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, promoted him over all the other four stars and services, uh, recommended him to the president, and the president uh, nominated him, and, and we got him uh, confirmed by the Senate um, and worked very closely together for four years that I was secretary and, and uh, he was the uh, the chairman. Um, unfortunately, later on, after he became secretary of state, I became uh, mm-hmm. vice president. The, the uh, That same old relationship didn't work. Uh, we did not uh, get along. Had he, had you changed or had he changed, Mr. Vice President? Oh, I think we were in different jobs, different responsibilities. When we were at the Pentagon, I was the civilian head of the Pentagon. He worked for me. Uh, I picked him. And uh, uh, it, it worked out fine, although sometimes we had our differences. We always were able to get them resolved. I, uh, by the time he got to state and um, I got back to the White House again, uh, that had changed pretty dramatically. At that point, did he have a different worldview than you did, or, or was it the same mm-hmm. worldview, just different well, perspectives? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm reluctant to pass those kinds of judgments. I mean, I, he uh, he can speak for himself. Uh, there was a book done called Soldier, uh, written by a woman uh, named Karen DeYoung. That's a biography, basically, of, uh, of General Powell. It was done, I think, after he left our administration. And... Um, uh, I think it's reflective of uh, General Powell's views. I'd uh, I'd advise you to go take a look there if you want to understand his motives. We're with Vice President Dick Cheney, his new book, In My Time, A Personal and Political Memoir. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, he starts off the book with a bang on those fateful moments on 9-11. What about those that are looking back 10 years, 10 years ago, and we still have these 9-11 truthers who deny that a plane hit the Pentagon, who who deny that this was the work of the people who've admitted it was their work, We'll talk about 9-11 and a colorful epithet, as he mentions it in the book, directed at Patrick Leahy. Have we seen the tone and tenor of politics actually decline, or is it just like it's always been over the last 40 or 50 years in politics? We'll talk more with Vice President Dick Cheney about that and more in just three minutes.